In yeah. December 61, Kennedy sent advisors and a number of us from different peace groups who were disappointed that are in other groups, also progressive labor or other socialists, whatever group, were concerned that our own groups weren't taking a stand on, on the specific issue of Vietnam. We were talking, they were talking about peace generally and disarmament. Mm -hmm. We were opposing nuclear testing. Uh, so different individuals from those groups, I, I among them organized a demonstration in Lowell, Manhattan to protest Kennedy sending those advisors in December of 61. So mm -hmm. my, that was my first specifically Vietnam action. We became a, most aware of Vietnam when the, the first immolation of a Buddhist monk occurred in 1963. And some of us in Women's Strike said we have to put disarmament aside and get rid of this war, which shouldn't happen. I chose to non-cooperate. I refused to report for induction in 1964, the first time mm -hmm. that they backed off, and then they re-inducted me later when the war started picking up in 65. But I took a position um, in the courts and to attempt to create a forum about the war, that um, the war was uh, illegal because of the uh, UN Charter, it's an aggressive mm -hmm. war, war crimes would be committed, crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. And I argued that the Nuremberg precedents um, obligated me to um, live up to my individual responsibility to not be complicit with that. So uh, that case, there was a trial in New Haven. Um, I got a retrial because of the denial of counsel issue. Uh, I was retried and got five years in prison. So I ended up getting paroled after two years. A fellow by the name of David Miller was the, uh, uh, the first person who burned his draft card after Congress had basically passed a law saying that the destruction of a, of a draft card was uh, punishable by five years in prison. So David, um, I believe it was in October of 1965, burned his card. I was, of course, friends with David. We worked together. So it was in November of um, 1965 that myself and uh, four other young people uh, burned their draft cards at uh, Union Square. I served uh, two years of the three-year sentence. Read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and I did. Changed my life. The guy in his car coming back said to me, well, if you want to do something, a whole bunch of cities, we've got groups, and we're going to do a draft card turn-in. We're going to resist the draft. That was it. So with four other guys, we co-founded something called the New England Resistance, which was the largest draft anti-draft group in the country. Um, in fact, that's what resulted in the Spock trial. And I was an unindicted co-conspirator in the Spock trial. A group of us, a small group, I think it was 47, signed a full-page ad in the student newspaper saying, we won't go. Under any circumstances, we are not going. Well, this was against the law of the country. There was a Selective Service Act. You were breaking the law. You're saying, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not doing this. And I'll never forget sitting in Coverly Auditorium as a freshman during Freshman Orientation Week in September of 1967, and David Harris telling us to get out our wallets and pull out our Selective Service draft registration cards. And then he launched into a pretty vivid description of what that system was all about and why we were carrying those cards and asked us to think once again about our personal stake in what our country was doing in our names in Vietnam. The university would send in where the students were in the ranking and then the draft board could draft the people in the bottom 25 percent, the men, uh, all over the country. Well the university didn't even keep class ranks, so to participate was to cooperate. And we said don't do that and we had a demonstration. There were um, demonstrations and students took over the administration building um, to protest the ranking, the uh, giving of the grades of the students to the draft boards. 
And at the same time, in that two and a half day experience, sleeping on top of file cabinets and meetings, 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 and just, you know, every second, I experienced a level of community, of social solidarity that was really new to me and was utterly eye-popping and motivating. So I'm, I'm interested in politics. Politics matters to me. History is what I'm majoring in. I realize this stuff matters. Yeah. I decide to start the chapter of SDS at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Mm -hmm. It starts as a small group, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so one of the things that we did was started to have meetings in the dorms, especially the dorms um, where the kids from the small towns in Wisconsin were staying. What I end up talking about a lot is there's, this, there's these great um, posters and these great ideas showing the sort of sexualization and oppression of the women in Vietnam and then women being treated as a sexual object in the United States. Oh, it was very sexist in the anti-war movement. Um, and on, a, on, on certain levels, it was very sexist in the community organizing I was doing. But luckily, there were a lot of strong women. And we were able to change that in some ways. And then in Detroit, um, uh, what I did is I was organizing SDS chapters in working class areas around the city. Uh, as a result of that work, I was chosen to represent the Detroit area to go to Cuba. This was in 1969 to meet with the National Liberation Front as part of a uh, anti-war conference. So it was very, very interesting hearing them speak about it. But what also blew my mind, it was not at all the subject of the meeting, but I was looking at the women and men, and I've never seen anything uh, more equal. And, you know, and that was something that I learned a lot about in the anti-war movement, that it was a very big thing in terms of the NLF. Uh, the role of women in terms of change and the role of women in the liberation movement. I was eagerly looking, you know, even since being a teenager, to see what I could do um, to end the war. I mean, because it was just felt un unbearable to me, you know, um, that this was happening to my country. I may be the only person that you'll talk to who was in high school international president of the largest Jewish youth group in the world. So on the one hand, I was in as international B'nai B'rith girls president being sent over to Israel to shake hands with Golda Meir and Abba Ibn and get like photo shots. And on the other hand, I was in meetings with SDS planning for the March in Washington. I decided that um, what I was going to do was write for my monthly uh, address to the B'nai B'rith girls around the world about why everyone should show up and protest at the moratorium um, and why this was good Jewish practice. And the um, B'nai B'rith refused to print my, my address um, because they claimed um, that being against the war in Vietnam would not read well for being in support of wars in Israel. The folks in my SDS chapter said, well, fight it. And so I did. And eventually, going to the Anti-Defamation League and saying very innocently, um, I mean, I'm not really sure about this, but I think you have to print what I want to say because I'm your international president. My first demonstration was in Pittsburgh, which I helped to organize in October of 1969. The next demonstration was about 800,000 people here in Washington, D.C., November 15th, 1969. And I became pretty much a full-time anti-war organizer at that moment and did it for the next four years nonstop. There are people here who were part of the sort of governing committee of the coalition. Dick Fernandez from the Clergy and Lady Concern, Cora Weiss from Women's Strike for Peace, David Dellinger. These were the if you will, the, the, the national leaders who put the coalition together. I was the staff person, I was the coordinator in that sense. Women's Strike sent me as their representative to the coalition of the mobilization 
and it was a very important lesson in gender inequality. I was one woman and three men, and it hasn't changed until this very minute. <laughs> we lived in D.C. And, and coordinated that march, including what was called the March Against Death, which from my experience in the anti-war movement was one of the most moving protests because what it did was memorialize the Americans who had died up till then, state by state, according to their number, and it was then 38,000. And, and delegations carried the names of the Americans who were killed from their state in a walk from Arlington Cemetery to the Capitol, passing the White House. And when a person passed the White House, carrying this placard with the name of someone from their state, Alabama or New Jersey, whatever it was, they lifted up the placard and called the name out to the White House. As we began to organize that, someone asked the question, what about the Vietnamese names? Well, of course, we realized we didn't have the Vietnamese names, and we would never have them. And in fact, here anyway, or worldwide, they're never known who all the Vietnamese would have killed. So what we did was we, we added placards to the march that named a Vietnamese village which had been entirely wiped out. And those names were also called out in front of the White House. I am a minister in the United Church of Christ, and all of my ministry has been uh, working with interfaith and ecumenical organizations, usually around some kind of social change or political issue. A group of about 100 clergy in October of 1965 had uh, held a press conference in New York supporting the right of free speech and supporting some persons who had just protested the war in Washington and were being labeled by the press as being un-American. So these clergy came to defend them and also to protest the war. I was actually going to a seminary at the time, so I was organizing churches. So after college, I went to graduate school for theological studies. And from there, I organized churches in Pittsburgh to participate in the demonstration October 15th. And the peace movement actually became my church. Not that it didn't have its own sexism, racism, patriarchy, it did. But in terms of working with people and getting to know people, it was a rich experience. And I felt that I came alive. I mean, I would be awake all night thinking about, OK, the next day in the organizing. I just felt really passionate about it. And it was, it was inspiring. And it fueled me. I've done social justice work my whole life. And that's, I, I got born in that crucible of political activity, which through your reflection about what that is and incorporating it into your own ethics, you sort of get a new sense of purpose and a new sense of uh, meaning in life. Yeah. I became very interested in Vietnam. I was also graduating in 1966, confronting the decision about what to do with my life and how to uh, deal with the military and the draft. And I chose to go to Vietnam um, with International Voluntary Services, which is similar to Peace Corps. It actually had been in Vietnam since the mid-50s. International Voluntary Services had volunteers uh, in education and community development, agriculture. Uh, a lot of them were conscientious objectors. My role there was to live with, work with Vietnamese, mostly young people. They were doing their own community service projects um, around uh, in Saigon and other communities, um, smaller towns. I ended up teaching English. Um, the idea of developing Vietnam during a wartime was incompatible. <laughs> we were beginning to feel like we had to make some kind of statement. And, and then by the fall of 1967, we'd been over a year, we decided, a group of us, that we had to make a bolder statement about Vietnam. And so we drafted a letter to President Johnson um, calling for an end to the war and withdrawal of Vietnam. And the letter did appear in the New York Times. It got, uh, I think, a paragraph in Time magazine. That ultimately, I stayed in Vietnam after I left COR and worked with Dispatch News Service International. And, uh, that was a news service started by Mike Morrow and 
David Oakes, and the idea was to write about uh, a little more of the human interest side of what was going on in Vietnam. And it also was a news service that uh, broke the My Lai story. Um, Seymour Hirsch had tried to get the story published. Somehow David Oakes saw the news benefit and broke it into a four-part piece and then sold it. And it created, uh, uh, obviously, a big stir at the time. And uh, So growing up as a, uh, in a pacifist family, um, it was clear to me uh, that I would not be fighting in Vietnam. So I, I got my alternative, I got my conscientious objection status, and then I chose to go to Vietnam with the Mennonite Central Committee. I spent three years there uh, working in a small village, Tam Ki, in what was then called Quang Tin Province, which is now Quang Nam Province up in central Vietnam, uh, what the military called the I Corps. It was the area that was fought over most heavily in, in Vietnam. After three years, I left and I could come home. I could go to graduate school. Uh, my friends couldn't. Uh, and I would, get, I would get messages, you know, this person was killed here, this person was killed there, that person was drafted against his will into the army and committed suicide, um, all these terrible things. And actually, it was the peace movement that helped me assuage my guilt at having survived. In 1970, um, there was a delegation of 13 students from all across the U.S., and I was in graduate school at the time. Um, we went, we met with um, the Saigon Student Union, then went to La Bangkok and Laos and, and on to Hanoi, met with the North Vietnamese Student Union, and we negotiated a treaty basically calling for Americans to leave uh, and for the Vietnamese to solve the problems among themselves, uh, which the Saigon students, the North Vietnamese students, and the American students all agreed to. Uh, and then we used it as an organizing mechanism in the United States. Hundreds of colleges and universities ratified the People's Peace Treaty to declare our peace with the Vietnamese to refuse to be enemies with them and to demand that our government also ratify the People's Peace Treaty. But in 1970, through 1973, I was working in Vietnam as the co-director of the American Friends Service Committee's program, humanitarian programs, mm -hmm. and which primarily there were multiple facets of the program, but the primary one was that we were training Vietnamese how to make artificial arms and legs and wheelchairs. Um, we had a, the first physical therapy program in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So we were war injured civilians would come to the center and um, be outfitted with arms and legs. But at the same time, the real purpose was for us not to be there providing the arms and legs, but was really to provide the training for mm -hmm. Vietnamese. There were a couple of, well, there was an island particularly where they had uh, bars and there were these little areas underneath the bars and they kept people in maybe a four foot, uh, they were used by the French for yes. Vietnamese. So maybe they only had four feet so they couldn't stand up mm -hmm. and uh, most of the prisoners were, got um, atrophy of their limbs. So when there was a prisoner release, some of these prisoners also came to our rehab center. I was at, at this prisoner exchange. Um, and that was extraordinary to me, that I would meet a man who at the age of 16 was put in a tiger cage and came out of there without able to, you know, being able to move his legs. So we already had access to the prison um, in Vietnam, so therefore we sort of had this legitimacy to go into this building where the, essentially the, most of the people in the building were people that had been badly tortured in the interrogation center and then they were brought to this building. 
And this was my witnessing the fact that Americans were, um, you know, coaching and mentoring, torturing, and that women were routinely tortured. And particularly, this was kind of towards the end, towards 73. And we were, you know, the Americans were losing the war. And so what they were doing was basically rounding up women and torturing them to say, you know, where's your father, where's your brother, um, you know, whose side are you on? And there was a 14-year-old child and a 65-year-old woman um, that was in the, in the prison. So I began to bring my camera in. And so I took pictures mm -hmm. and I sent them back. Um, and Amphacy really didn't do anything much about it. Mm -hmm. So then I came back in 73, and then suddenly, you know, the way the media will be interested in a topic, um, political prisoners were an, a topic of interest. Um, and these pictures were hot stuff. So they blew them up, and I went on, like, the Today Show, or good, I can't remember, Good Morning America. Mm -hmm. I traveled in the U.S. I traveled in Europe speaking about what I see as supported by Amnesty International. Paul, my husband, and I got married in 1971. Um, we had become involved with the American Friends Service Committee by then. We'd been on Quaker work camps. And we got this job after we graduated working in an international Quaker center in Paris. Wonderful job, of course. We were there just to do youth activities. Um, and what happened, of course, was that the Paris peace negotiations were going on then. And so a lot of these sort of um, side activities involving the peace negotiations happened at the Quaker Center. They opened it up for meetings with members of the Vietnamese delegations and um, peace activists coming from the U.S. who wanted to talk to the Vietnamese. Um, uh, there were other groups who met at our center, including the Indochina Peace Campaign. Um, so naturally, we came to have very close Vietnamese friends, um, who were, you know, they were distraught over this war and what it was doing to their country and families. Um, we knew Buddhist students, um, a Buddhist nun and monk. Um, there was a Catholic priest, Father T, and they were all sort of joined in this. Probably they were working with the NLF to raise awareness and convince people that the war had to end. After we finished our two years in Paris in 1973, after the Paris Peace Agreement, um, we were very lucky to be given the job by the American Friends Service Committee to become the Saigon representatives of the Service Committee. So we finally got our visas and got to South Vietnam in October. and started studying Vietnamese right away, very intensively, so that by January or so, we were beginning to carry on simple conversations and puzzle out what the newspapers said. Um, and part of our job was to support a physical rehab center in Quang Ngai province in the center. The other part was to report on what was going on in Saigon politics, um, what the peace activists were doing there. Um, and there were a lot of them in Saigon. There were people who put out petitions, organized demonstrations, and tried to promote the idea that there was uh, some kind of third segment, if not a force, that could act as a sort of bridge between the two sides to implement the peace agreement. And as I learned more and more about the war and thought about it, I realized that one of the reasons the war was continuing was because all the middle class white uh, kids, you get a note from a doctor, your father knows somebody, they get a student deferment and they could continue the war because the people they were drafting really didn't have much of a voice. And um, like you could buy your way out of the Civil War. So um, I gave up my draft deferment, you know, a bold gesture, but a, a risk. And uh, unfortunately, my number was called. And uh, so I was drafted and I went into the Army in May of 1966.
and I said, well, you know, um, I have a degree in psych, and it's my background, and I can best contribute to the Army, and my fellow soldiers, and yada, yada. And so they approved it, and I was off orders and sent to, the, um, uh, to work in the Mental Hygiene Consultation Division at Fort Jackson, where I worked for the remainder of my time in the Army as essentially what on the outside would be called a psychiatric social worker. My job was to uh, decide who should see a psychiatrist or talk to uh, recruits uh, who were having a hard time. They wanted out and I was part of the process that got them out. Some cried, um, weeping on the floor, uh, uh, some made suicidal gestures. I mean, uh, shortly thereafter, I got approached by some people who wanted to set up a coffee house in Colombia. And so we used it to talk to the troops. Uh, the bayonet training was conducted 